Thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back at the Atlantic Council. Uh, let me begin actually by recognizing two people who are not here, but with who for me in many ways were the engagement when I was ambassador and earlier, which is Fred Kemp and John Huntsman. And uh, I'm delighted to, I, I, know, I know many of you, but I'm particularly delighted to see Ambassador Dobryansky because the two of us worked on the kind of issues that I'm going to talk about when we were both uh, in the administration. So uh, look, uh, when I uh, uh, thought I should come and you know, avail of your invitation, I, I, I felt I should really address what is the core mission of this institution which was initially, uh, to my understanding, a body which was set up to promote uh, transatlantic understanding and then has grown beyond that to actually take on the, uh, the, the responsibility of uh, uh, engaging the world beyond the transatlantic world uh, as well. Uh, so uh, the, the, my remarks today are really focused on those sets of issues, which in a sense you could say, how does India relate to the West? How does the West hopefully relate to India? And where do we go on uh, from here? Now, uh, you know, many of you would have heard uh, in another country the term a century of humiliation. Okay. India actually had two centuries of humiliation with the West because the West kind of in, a, in its predatory form came into India uh, in the mid 18th century and continued al almost exactly for two, well, for 190 years after that. And uh, it was interesting, uh, uh, I think a year ago, uh, there was actually a, a very serious economic study uh, which tried to estimate how much the British took out of India in value terms. And a very calculated math ended up put a number of $45 trillion at today's value. So that should give you a sense of really what happened in those uh, 200 years. So while we, we will speak of all the uh, things we shared today, the reality also is that the history of India and the West is also a history of really of famine, of slavery, of opium trade. So there is a very dark side uh, to all of this. Now, this is the 150th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. It's almost on October 2nd is actually the birth anniversary. And I think it's worth a while to pause and reflect on how a leader like him actually changed India's attitude towards the West. That in 1947, when India got independence, it need not have had the kind of relationship with the West which it did thereafter. Uh, we can debate the merits of it, but I think it's extraordinary in a way that a country which struggled so long for its independence, after that actually uh, kind of m reached uh, informal understanding or a compact uh, in a sense uh, with the West. And I would sort of regard that as really uh, the ability to set history aside and allow you know, politics and economics and uh, uh, social uh, connections to, to take over. So what you don't see in India and have not seen for the last 70 years, even at the most difficult times uh, with the West, has been a kind of mobilization around an anti-Western uh, sort of uh, nationalism. Uh, that uh, uh, it has been actually, uh, in many ways, I would say, uh, uh, a cordial relationships. If it was not cordial, it was certainly not frictional. Uh, and uh, part of that was also the way we, you know, uh, set up our own institutions and created our own society. And uh, at the end of the day, the fact that we are a liberal democracy, the fact that there is a governance model based on a rule of law, the fact that there is social pluralism, uh, and that uh, we are a market economy. I think these were all really very uh, powerful factors which actually enabled us to put that history uh, behind us. And here I would make one point before shifting to my next uh, argument, which is that India's choices in 1947 and thereafter actually took what were Western 
values and Western practices and made them near universal. So today, if you have in the developed world or the South, or whatever you call it, really Asia, Africa, parts of Latin America, if you have today a belief that democracy is an ethically uh, superior model of governance. In part, it is due to the fact that the first big uh, post-colonial polity actually chose that and then sustained it despite extraordinary odds uh, over the last 70 years. So let's look at the last 70 years, and uh, these last 70 years have really been a very complex uh, history. Uh, at one level, I would say the West has actually been very, very supportive of uh, India's uh, growth, India's rise, if you would. Uh, you can see that in politics, you can see that in security, in trade, in investment, in services, uh, in education, uh, in, a, in particularly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, in development assistance of uh, various kinds. You can see that in the uh, way the Indian diaspora, particularly the more modern voluntary diaspora is located. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I, I would say, you know, this, this, that 40s to uh, perhaps the late 90s, I mean, let, let's say the 20th century in that sense. This was a period where actually this, this what I described a cordial, non-frictional relationship was largely in play. And I think it's had a very invaluable role really in building the India that we have today. But having said that, it is what I would call a sort of a Goldilocks era of our relationship, which is the West didn't want India to get too weak. It didn't want India to get too strong. So it stirred the Indian porridge, or tried to stir the Indian porridge just right. And sometimes, you know, got it, uh, uh, say there were margins of error on either side. So you actually have a very, uh, interesting uh, sort of uh, situation where when India, in 1962, uh, after the conflict where we were defeated, actually the West comes to the assistance of India. But in less than a decade, in 1971, when it seems to the West that India is seeking a primacy in the subcontinent, the West opposes India. So, so that's the, there's a sort of a bandwidth in which uh, the relationship operates. Now, this bandwidth is not just episodic. I mean, if you look, where is it that we got our relationship right and where is it we did not? Uh, pretty much across the development spectrum, the West was very supportive. But when it came to uh, industrialization, uh, particularly in heavy industries, or when it came to defense and security, the West was very conservative. So you had uh, sort of uh, both geopolitical or political moments, as well as sectors where uh, there was a there was this very uh, interesting, I would say, almost a management of of uh, relations. And uh, t today, if you go to the archives, and you know a lot of what where the internal thinking of multiple administrations are uh, uh, very uh, are there for people to access. Uh, I, I, I think it's most starkly actually laid out by President Eisenhower, uh, but you, you can see strains of it before him, after him, through multiple administrations. But this idea that how do you keep India in play, a weak India is bad for American Western interests, an uh, excessively strong India is also a problem of a kind. By the way, those days mostly they worried about a weak India. Uh, so uh, this this, in a sense, was the uh, sort of scenario uh, through the 20th century. Now, somewhere along the way, that began to change, and I'll uh, talk about it. But even though it's changed, I do believe some of the structural issues uh, which, where there are divergences between India and the West do continue. It's visible on trade, it's visible on IPR issues. It can be visible uh, sometimes on, uh, you know, uh, issues of uh, non-proliferation, freedom, civil rights, you know, which cause do you support, which cause do you not. Sometimes we look at situations where we say, you know, why is, why is the West broadly and the U.S. looking away from what is a visible violation of rights? There'd be times when some, in some form the same question would be asked of us. And the bottom line for me really is 
uh, for all that we have in common, we also need to recognize that we are coming from a different place and we do have different histories. So a lot of the challenge today for us is to reconcile that. So having stated that, what is our current conundrum? Uh, from the Indian side, I think there is a, uh, there's a clear sense that uh, you know, the power of the West remains very strong. That if you look at the world, the institutions, the regimes, the rules, the practices, the narratives of the world are still largely shaped uh, by the West. Uh, the West underwrites international systems, uh, international system in many ways. It really governs the global commons also in many ways. Uh, but having said that, what has been visible particularly in the last 10 years, uh, and in the case of China perhaps even before that, there is a rebalancing underway. Uh, the rebalancing was accelerated by the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. And what was in initially seen as an economic rebalancing is actually um, today become a much larger, uh, I would say, uh, strategic cultural uh, rebalancing as well. And if there is a, a sort of a single way by which you could capture that, it's the fact today that the G20 uh, has really replaced the G7 uh, as the primary body for global deliberations. Now, while I say that the, uh, the West still retains uh, uh, great dominance over the uh, international system, it's also a fact that we see a much more divided West, and part of the reason is that the United States uh, has been, uh, is the glue that holds the West together. Uh, and I use West in the largest, you know, uh, most expansive sense of the term. I mean, I would call Japan in that sense as part of the West, or uh, perhaps uh, Korea. So I, I use the, you know, uh, not uh, really a geographical or a ethnic definition, but I capture the alliance constructs or the OECD uh, part of it as well. And so uh, today, as the world is getting more multipolar, the West is also getting more multipolar. And that's a very interesting dynamic uh, when you uh, look at the West. Now, I see two propositions. One, that the West needs India. It needs India because India is an additional engine of growth that the market access is important, that India's human resources will become more relevant to the world, that we will move to a multipolar world, have, in a sense, moved to it, uh, and therefore it's important to manage the multipolarity by having good relations with multiple worlds. Uh, the fact that in many areas there would be burden sharing of some kind, you can already see that, for example, in HADR operations in our part of the world. And then on global issues, it's important to work uh, for with a country like India, and I think nothing illustrates that more than climate change and what happened at Paris. But having said that, I would make the converse argument, which is India needs the West. And India needs the West for a variety of reasons, but I would give you the simplest historical argument for it, which is that every major growth story in the last 150 years has actually paradoxically happened with the support of the West. So whether it is the rise of Japan, whether even the rise of Soviet, Soviet Union, uh, the rise of Korea, uh, of the ASEAN, of China, all these would not have been possible had they not been done in tandem with the Western interests and Western thinking of uh, that period. The direction of the global uh, economy would also uh, make a stronger argument for this bonding. Uh, because as we move into a world of uh, a more knowledge economy world, uh, one of greater uh, technology interdependence, clearly an important factor would be uh, the flow of talent uh, in the world. And there I would suggest that actually India has a somewhat unique position vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the economies uh, of the West. So the question which flows from all of this is, uh, is, there, is it possible, is it likely, that there's actually a new compact uh, between uh, India uh, and the West. Uh, because if this rebalancing has to be uh, reflected uh, in uh, a different equilibrium, in different equations, uh, in new methods of working each other, 
is there is there actually uh, uh, a sense of how to work that out? So that brings me then to the next question: What does it take us to get to that new compact? And obviously, the first uh, point there is to have the realization that there's a need for a new compact. Uh, I think that realization is today strong in the United States. Uh, I see that to a certain extent in Japan. Uh, I see that less in Europe, but moving in the right direction. Uh, so it is a, it is a, even the awareness aspect of it clearly needs more work and uh, for this to, to develop uh, further. Now, uh, the, the, when I say what does it take, I would say uh, that awareness, first of all, needs to translate itself into a recognition uh, of the need for a new balance, uh, which means you really have different kinds of collaborations, uh, different conversations. Uh, and in all of this, obviously, uh, India would hedge enough to make sure that it will always have a strong bargaining hand vis-a-vis -vis the West. So the fact that India has uh, other equities and other activities does not detract from what uh, will be, at the end of the day, uh, 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 sort of a, a central aspect of its uh, foreign policy direction. Uh, there are other aspects of what it takes, and one of them is also an understanding of a changed India. A changed India uh, that uh, democratization over the last 70 years in India has had its own impact. That uh, if you look today at India, the politics of India, the, the, the social aspects of India, uh, bluntly put, the old elite uh, is now uh, out of business. And really, uh, you have a new set of people with their you know, uh, different thoughts, with their own uh, you know, sense of uh, uh, roots, uh, who relate to the world obviously differently from the people uh, who dominated the Indian political scene before them. A third aspect of it, from uh, certainly from the Indian point of view, would be uh, how you know how w one part of it is how do you build bridges, and there the role of the diaspora would be very important. But increasingly, what we can see is that the treatment of the diaspora abroad becomes a factor in India's uh, responses to a particular country or society. So I see that really not just as a conversation between India and its diaspora, but also uh, a factor in our uh, relations with other countries and uh, uh, other partners. Now, uh, as, and, and, and in a sense, that's a, that's a two-way uh, factor, because the diaspora also uh, relates, to, you know, our, particularly the Indian diaspora relates much more to development in home country than many other diasporas do. That's something we can discuss if there's interest. Uh, the, uh, you know, from, from the Indian point of view, uh, as I said, we've, we've in the past noted the, the fact that the current world order is very much built on institutions and practices which were advanced, which were created, envisaged, and socialized by the West. Uh, but uh, we also, frankly, looking ahead, uh, I mean, our sense is really the, the theories of the decline of the West are grossly overstated. Uh, that if you look at technology, uh, if you look at even defense budgets, if you look at the will to exercise power, uh, in all of this, if you look at new instruments of pressure which have uh, appeared on the international scene in the last 10 years, in all of this, actually, uh, the West uh, very much maintains uh, its leads. So the task before us, uh, if we are to move in this direction, is one, of course, to strengthen our convergences. Uh, and there are issues today, very obvious issues to work together, issues like counterterrorism, issues like uh, maritime uh, security, issues like connectivity. Uh, but there will also be divergences. And I think part of the challenge would be to, to manage those. A uh, lot of those would arise in third country situations uh, like Russia or Iran. Uh, and some of it would also be to overcome history. That uh, one of the, uh, I would say, the burdens that India carries is the fact that it was not part 
it was not a central part of the 1945 order. It wasn't on the high table at that point of time. So how do you make the world more contemporary? How do you make the world order more contemporaneous? Uh, and here I would argue that it is very much in the interest of the West to do that. Uh, and, uh, but it's obviously, again, not a task that is easy. The symbol of that is the UN Security Council, but that's not the only, uh, only uh, facet of that particular argument. So I would end with a concluding observation, which is that as India itself rises, we are today the fifth or sixth largest economy, which certainly would be the third largest economy, even in nominal terms by 2030. We will be the most populous country uh, in less than the next five years. Uh, so the, the question which we ask ourselves, and I guess in a way the world asks itself, is really what kind of power India would be. And I think pa a large part of that answer is obviously with that. But I think one part of that answer is also with the West. Uh, and what kind of relationship we now forge together, uh, to my mind, would, would really uh, uh, give us the full picture. So why don't I stop my remarks there, and I'd be happy to take questions. Sure. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jayashankar, for essentially giving us the Jayashankar doctrine. Uh, and you know, what was I thought was, was anyway going to be a fascinating conversation has sort of been elevated by your willingness to engage in uh, a preview, really, of a strategic vision of how India engages with the West in the 21st century under your leadership and the leadership of your government. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Shringla and your team from the embassy, all of you honored guests. We're very grateful that you would take time this morning to join us. So I'm going to ask uh, the minister a couple of questions to get this conversation going, and then, of course, open it up. Uh, you can indicate using your name tent. Uh, if you want to ask a question, I'm happy to uh, call on you. And again, just a reminder that this is on the record. So Dr. Jayashankar, let's start with, in a sense, a softball, <laughs> if you would, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, get, we'll, we'll start the bouncers in a minute. But, uh, so starting with the Prime Minister's appearance with President Trump in Houston, then a very full week, as Damon alluded to, of bilateral and multilateral meetings in New York, and then last afternoon with uh, Secretary Pompeo in the evening. Uh, you have probably are leaving, you will leave Washington and leave the United States with a much clearer sense of how uh, the West, as you've described them, is thinking about India at this particular moment in time, what the real challenges are to get the U.S.-India relationship to where you would like it to be. Um, would you be willing to give us a bit of a readout, as it were, about what you take away from this very long set of meetings over the last week? Uh, first, my meetings aren't over yet. Uh, so I, I still have uh, a few more secretaries to go. Well so I'm meeting Secretary Esper, uh, I think, tomorrow, uh, and uh, the new NSA as well as the Homeland Security Acting Secretary, um, and be meeting a lot of business uh, in, in different formats. But look, um, I mean, to my mind, uh, that I'd, I'd kind of put my interest areas in two broad baskets, OK? Uh, one would be really the politics of the West, particularly the internal politics of the West, because, I mean, it's, to say that uh, uh, the Western societies are today uh, having an active debate would be the understatement of the year. Every one of them in some form uh, has uh, uh, that as an ongoing activity. Uh, but really, it's, it's actually a very, uh, I mean, to my mind, uh, really, the, these few years are going to also probably take us in a very different direction than uh, in the past. I, that's, that's very obvious. And it's also obvious it's very differentiated. You know, I spend a lot of time in Europe, uh, not just in this job, even in my previous job. And uh, you, can, you can see today that the, uh, if you take the breadth of the political spectrum, both to the left and the right, I mean, on both sides, actually, there's been a kind of a, uh, expansion if you add. And I think to some, to a large extent, that's true of American politics as well. Uh, and when you, you have, you know, the two extremes expanding, you obviously have, in each case, uh, much sharper uh, arguments uh, within. But our concern is not to get into those arguments, because we look at the aggregate outcome and where does, 
where do individual power centers and nation stand, where do they stand collectively. Uh, and that really brings me to the second basket. And the second basket is really the economic technology basket, uh, if you would, because I, I think the uh, rate of change, uh, rate of social change in the world is so extraordinary today. And the importance of technology, what, I mean, it holds a promise actually beyond our imagination that uh, if you were to think back every five years, you couldn't have imagined where you were uh, out there. Uh, and what does that then do for our relationship? Because uh, in India, you know, we, we can't grow the old-fashioned way. We can't go up the manufacturing ladder and then industrialize and then scale it up. So we'll have to kind of do a very uh, unique mix of leapfrogging, of uh, shortcuts, of, you know, improvisations. Uh, so if you were to ask me, so how is India going to grow? You know, would it be manufacturing? Would it be services? Would it be startups? Would it be uh, skills? Would it be exports? Would it be, uh, you know, uh, globalized talent-driven? Would it be insular? My answer would be all of the above, mm -hmm. because I, I think we'll kind of end up in that uh, situation. And that kind of India and this much more differentiated, complex West, their coming together to me is, is really a proposition which is, which has a, you know, which is very desirable, but is not, is clearly not just not inevitable, but not easy. It will have its challenges. I mean, there will be uh, issues, there will be decisions we would make, which, uh, you know, some segments here may not like. It would work the other way around uh, as well. And we'll have to take our lumps as we, as we try to forge uh, 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 different, better uh, relationship. So I leave uh, uh, after this trip, uh, even more fascinated by the internal discourse of uh, the places I visit. Uh, but uh, I also leave confident from everybody, and you know, I met and all the conversations that I had that uh, there is a. I mean, if there are some issues on which everybody agrees uh, today, certainly the idea that. Uh, you know, the Western world and especially the United States, which, as I said, has been the thought leader uh, in that direction. Uh, the fact that our relationship today has a strategic uh, significance, I, I think I'll leave very confident of that.